Welcome home, Lay. <laughs> Fine. Your office is waiting for you, boy. Fine. Did you hear that? I moved Devons down the hall and fixed his office up for you. So, take a look at that. I ordered that changed. what the attorney said, it might take several months. I only heard what J.R. ordered. What were my orders? I tried, J.R., but your attorney said it was a legal matter. It takes quite a bit of doing to change the name of a corporation, J.R., you know that. Do you know you ruined my son's homecoming? But, J.R., you just can't make that big a change with only two days' notice. I talked to your attorneys. I was trying to protect you. They said that I... Get out of here. Dad. Do you know how long I've been waiting for this day to come? To bring my son home from college and show what I worked so hard for all my life? To show the world it's Compton and son? But, J.R., your attorneys are still working on it. If he is not of this plant within ten minutes, have the factory police throw him out. <laughs> well, he got his degree all right. Yeah. Magna cum laude. Eh? <laughs> the smart boy, the other man, a smart boy. Congratulations, Ray. We're all proud of you. Come along, son. Mr. Compton. Well, here's your office, son. I want you close to me. So as the years go by, you'll know enough about this business to take over lock, stock, and barrel. Nice office, Dad. Uh, you're not really going to fire Mr. Cornwell, are you? Well, of course I am. But hasn't he been with you a long time? Mm, apparently not long enough to know that when I give an order, it's an order. Look, Dad, he didn't spoil my homecoming. I appreciate you wanting to put my name in the firm. My right? son, there is no room for softness in the Compton world. What with taxes when your competitors trying to cut your throat at every opportunity? And agitators and commies trying to get into your factory. The throttle you. You've got to be hard. You've got to be as hard as the steel and this sword. You know, I think the best way for you to be getting an idea of the empire that you're going to be president of is to study our catalog. Find out what every factory is making. Evans, come in. That seems like a destructive way to make a point. The important thing is I made it. No halfway measures in anything. Remember that, my boy. Your old man is a big man because he never did anything halfway. Evans, I'm assigning Ray to you. I want you to answer all his questions, tell him everything he wants to know. Because you know, in a year or so, he's going to be your boss and mine. <laughs> Counting six. We make nothing but metal office equipment there. Desks, chairs, filing cabinets, lockers, safes, and so on. 
<laughs> All right, Miss Garner, will you draw the curtains, please? I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll wind up our trip in St. Louis at the opening of plant number seven. And, uh, Miss Garner, will you please send those teletypes out today to all the plant managers and tell them that I want my son to read all the key personnel at each establishment, huh? Yes, Mr. Compton. Well, my boy, you're really going to see a dream come true at number seven. Within a couple of years, we're going to manufacture our own automobiles. Yes, sir, the Compton Special. <laughs> well, what do you think of the trip now? Well, it sounds all right. It seems to me that the only way for me to get the feel of the business is to work at it. Yes, but you're working at it now. It takes time. No, Dad. I, I mean really work. In the mill, in the machine shop. I want to know how and what we make, not just how much profit we show. I'm as anxious to learn about the firm as you are to have me learn, but... what well, the things I've been doing. Studying catalogs, efficiency layouts, payroll reports, even this trip. I can't learn anything that way. And I can't learn what I want to know listening to Evans or, or going around with you shaking hands with your plant managers in the various cities. <laughs> Do you mean that? You really want to learn to be a machinist? And you, start, you want to start in a machine shop like your old man did? I don't see any other way, Dad. <laughs> and here people have been telling me how I've been spoiling you all these years. <laughs> and you're a chip off the old block. You're my son. Yes, you are. <laughs> Come here. I don't know whether you've ever seen this, but it might interest you. That's where I started. You don't have to do it the hard way like your old man did. But I'm glad you want to do it. You start the machine shop on Monday. Ray Compton Apprentice. No favors. No special treatment. I've got to do it on my own. Right. And will you uh, let me help you buy the tools? Because a machinist must furnish his own, you know. Well, uh, as your future boss, I give you permission to knock off where you go shopping. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea a machinist laid out this kind of money for two. <laughs> These things are expensive. Yes, of course. Uh, you can't measure a thousandth of an inch, you know, with a dime store rule. <laughs> well, tell me, how do you like it? We put up over uh, 300 houses last year, making a total a little, little over a thousand. Yeah. Only for Compton employees, of course. <laughs> when you get into the machine shop, you're apt to hear what a terrible monster I am. <laughs> Uh, people are funny. Do nice things for them, give them nice houses to live in, reasonable rent, and all of a sudden they hate you. <laughs> Human nature, I guess. Every single place. It's amazing. Oh, it's nothing to it if you put up 300 in a crack. All you got to do is move in a good crew. No, I, I don't mean that. Each house, all they grow is... Petunias? Why? Well, because I like petunias. <laughs> I keep a dozen gardeners working on those places the year round. Keep them in order. <laughs> you know, the, uh, <clears throat> the the double ruffle petunias are very attractive flower. But I like the nice old-fashioned one, the single one, you know. The, the color is more distinctive. You mean they can't grow any other kind? Of, a rose bush? Some other flower? Oh, of course not. They're my houses and my gardens, aren't they? Well, yes, but... Look, son, I pay my help good wages. I give them nice places to live in. And if any man doesn't like the way I run my business or the town, well, it's a free country. <laughs> he can go someplace else. But as long as he's working for me and he lives in the town that I built and own, he's got to do it my way. Or our way. <laughs> That's why I'm counting on you to keep things the way they are when you take over someday. <laughs> uh, have you heard from Betty Coughlin since you've been back? Well, she won't be back from Europe for at least ooh, nine months, maybe a year. Mm -hmm. Do you think yeah, you two will ever get together? I hadn't thought much about it. Mm -hmm. I'd think about it if I was you. <laughs> Look, Dad. Mm -hmm. I like Betty. Maybe it's more than just like. Don't turn her into a petunia, huh? 
Compton, I, I guess you're all ready to go to work, huh? Yes, sir. I'd appreciate it if you didn't call me Mr. Compton. Just treat me like any other fellow starting out to work here. <laughs> Anything you say, uh, Ray? <laughs> well, uh, apprentices don't generally get anything but the uh, dirty work to do, but in your case... Oh, I'm not afraid of dirt. Well, uh, Mr. Evans said that you'd like to learn something about the uh, machine tools, lathes, gear cutters, and whatnot. Yes, sir. Well, let's see... I know. I'll start you out with Ed Jinx. He's one of our top men. Come on. Jinx, shut off the lathe. I just put on a new apprentice. Turned him over to you. Teach him how to run a lathe. Uh, Ray, this is Ed Jinx. How do you do, Mr. Jinx? Hello. Ray, don't forget what I told you. I'm holding you responsible in case he gets hurt. Certainly anxious to learn all I can. What do you got in there? Oh, my tools. I hope I got the right. Somebody die and leave you a fortune? Wait, no, I, I saved up for it. Look, this is a lathe. A turning tool. It's practically the granddaddy of all machine tools. All of the others are more or less like it. Milling machines, drillers, borers, gear cutters, planers, shapers, they, they're practically all alike. And that the lathes, they couldn't have been invented. You know how to read a blueprint? I think so. Well, put your tools on the bench and hand me that fancy micrometer of yours. How much longer do you intend to stay in the machine shop? You've been there six months now. I had Jack says I'm learning fast. That I may get over being an apprentice in three or four years. Three or four years? Well, you yourself said it takes a long time to become a full-fledged machinist. Yes, I know, but... something, Ed? With all those machines in there and all you guys that know how to run them, it still isn't a very efficient factory, is it? Huh? <laughs> Boy, you lost me. No, what I mean is, do you ever get a feeling of accomplishment out of what you're doing? Like I'm getting, I mean. I don't know. I get a lift out of the fact that you've learned something that I taught you to do. But how do you feel about what you make? Nothing much anymore. None of us work for anything but the checks now. That's the way it seems to me, too. Even after working here almost a year, men perform what, to me, seem like minor miracles of precision. And they don't seem to get any kick out of it at all. The only kick that anybody gets out of working for Compton is in the seat of the pants. <laughs> Get over how that gear cutter operates. It must have taken forever to make a gear before that machine was invented. Yeah. Things are a lot easier now than they were 30 years ago. Well, good night, Ray. See you tomorrow. Good night, Ed. Ray! Ray! Why, 
I didn't believe it when Daddy told me you were actually working. Now I have to. J.R. Compton, son in overalls. And I left a perfectly beautiful, clean young man in Rome to hurry back to this. What's the idea, a joke, or are you slumming? Let's get out of here. Hey, Dick. Huh? Say, do you know who's been your partner for the past year? No. Old man Compton's son. Oh, no. Well, good night, Paul. Good night. Probably seems kind of silly to you. Kind of does, even to my father. But, well, it, it's important to me to learn more about the business and just how much profit it shows. Really, darling, you don't have to explain to me. You just never struck me as the type to get grease on your hands, that's all. Well, what's the matter with that? What's so terrible about it? Look, it's my first night home. I don't want to argue with you. I don't want to argue either, but, well, the way you make, make it sound, if somebody works with their hands and gets a little dirty doing it, he's something out of a sewer. I didn't say that. Well, it sounded that way. I was just a little surprised, that's all. After all, darling, I remember when you wouldn't even change a tire on a car. You had to call a motor club to keep from getting yourself dirty. I come home and find you wallowing in it. You know, I've learned more in that machine shop in one year than I've learned all the rest of my life put together. Betty, you should meet that Jenks. He can run a lathe with his eyes closed. A what? A lathe. It's, it's a turning tool. See the legs on that chair? They can be duplicated on a lathe. I don't think they were made that way, though. You used to be more interested than my legs and those on a chair. I still am. Did you get lots of whistles in Europe? I don't answer to anybody's whistle but yours. You're spoiled. Spoil me some more. Let's get in the car and drive somewhere. Not tonight, honey. It's, it's too late. Late? Well, it isn't even midnight. But you forget I'm a working man now. Have to be on the job at 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock? In the morning? You'd be surprised how many people get up that early. Even earlier, lots of them. How long are you going to keep up this stupid masquerade? It's not stupid and it's no masquerade. And I'm going to keep at it until I learn what I feel I have to learn. Well, I'm not the type to play second fiddle to a machine. Don't bother to drive me home. I can find better company on the car radio. Ed, what have we got lined up today? What do you want me to do, Ed? Suit yourself, Mr. Compton. It's your factory. I've been working in the shop to try and learn the business, to try and find out how a machinist feels, to understand your problems. You couldn't have any of my problems, so it's a big waste of time for you to learn them. Well, we've been getting along all right, haven't we? Yeah. Men generally get along all right. Till they find out that one of them has been living a lie. If you'd have known who I was to start with, you, you wouldn't have had anything to do with me. Look, Ed. I'd like to be friends again, like we used to. You better put on your goggles, Mr. Compton. This is liable to throw some chips. What right have you got to be so superior to that you can't even be civil to me. Just because I'm the son of the man who owns this factory. Oh. I told you to put on your goggles. Here, let me see. You better get the first aid. Come on. Let's get out. He's lucky. 
The metal didn't strike the eye, just a superficial cut in the lid. No serious damage. Well, that's a good thing. If he had been blinded, I would have... Evans, come in here. Okay, that's all, Doctor. Yes, Mr. Compton. Put a fresh bandage on tonight, and it'll be fine tomorrow. Thanks, Doctor. Evans, did you take care of the shop? All done, J.R. Jenks has been paid off and is on his way. We'll dock Preston a day's pay to teach him a lesson, too. You told them we are holding them strictly responsible. Yes, but after all, he wasn't at the machine when it Wait happened. Wait a minute. Do you mean that Jenks has been fired because of this? Naturally. Naturally? It wasn't his fault. He told me to put the goggles on. Then he shouldn't have started the machine until you had them on. Firing Jenks, docking Preston. It makes no sense at all. Oh, doesn't it? Look, Ray, you could have lost an eye. Lots of fellows do. Jenks and Preston were responsible for your safety. I don't care what happens to them. I only care what happens to you. They slipped up, and I will not tolerate slip-ups. The only slip-up, as you call it, was mine. And I think it's unfair to penalize two innocent people for my mistake. Compton's never make mistakes. That sounds like a shocking statement to you, doesn't it? It's incredible. Well, make it your slogan. I made it mine. We are infallible. We must be. Otherwise, how could we have risen to the position of importance and power we enjoy? Other people are wrong. But you as a Compton are never wrong. You can't possibly be serious. I was never more serious in my life. How do you think I built up this corporation? By admitting my mistakes? Of course I made mistakes, hundreds of them. But nobody could prove it because they wouldn't dare. And I, I could yell louder than the other fellow. And bear that in mind. The fellow that can yell the loudest always wins the argument. So, uh, cultivate your lungs. What has this got to do with firing at Jenks? Well, everything. Jenks because he started the machine before you had your goggles on. And Preston because he, he should have been more watchful. And even though I ignored the warning to wear my goggles, I'm right because my name is Compton? Exactly. Now go home, have a rest, take care of that eye. And think over what I said. Remember it. It's the philosophy of success. I think it's right. to see Mr. Ed Jenks. I'm sorry he hasn't come home from work yet. Would you like to come in and wait for him? Well, thanks. I'm his daughter, Jane. I just got home from the office. Won't you make yourself at home? Daddy will be along soon. He's hardly ever late. Unless his foreman keeps him over for something. Would you excuse me a moment? Sure. Do you work with Daddy? Uh, yes. What's your name? What did you say? Uh, Ray. What? Compton. 
Compton. You must take an awful ribbing, having that name in this town. What's the matter with your eye? Oh, it's nothing. It's just a little scratch. Would you like some lemonade or something? No, thanks. I've got to get my dinner started. Did Daddy invite you for dinner? No. Oh, that's good, because I only bought two chops. Somebody'd have to end up with scrambled eggs. I like scrambled eggs. Ray Compton, are, are you... You said you worked with Daddy. Oh, I, I did. Until I got this silly little cut. I think J.R. has a son named Raymond or something like that. But he's been away at college for forever. I guess he couldn't be you. Would you throw me out if I were? I'd be awfully tempted. You know how people in this town feel about Compton. I've really got to start my dinner. I'd better wait outside for your father. Oh, but you're perfectly welcome to wait here. No, I'm not. I'm J.R.'s son. What I mean is... Oh, never mind. You know who this is? I just found out. Ed, I, I want to tell you, I didn't have anything to do with your being fired. All right. You've cleared your conscience. You better leave now. Hello? Yes, this is Miss Jenks speaking. Mr. Murdoch. I see. Yes, I, I understand perfectly. Yes. Just mail the check to me. Goodbye. Coptons don't lose a minute, do they? I've just been fired, too. Is this Mr. Murdoch? Mr. Murdoch is a vice president of the Security Federal Bank. But he Does has... my father own that bank? Well, he has an interest in it. Phone Mr. Murdoch. Tell him I'm on my way over to see him. He's to wait for me. Understand? He's to wait for me. Yes, Mr. Compton, but. just why you're interested in Miss Jenks? No, you may not. I want to know why she was fired. With all respect to you, Mr. Compton, that is the bank's business. Look, I'd better straighten you out about something. Remember, I'm the heir to the Compton estate. Someday I'm going to take over my father's business, lock, stock, and barrel. And you may be one of the first people I get rid of unless you get off that plush horse of yours and tell me what I want to know. Wait, anything, Mr. Compton. Anything at all. Who told you to fire Miss Jenks? Well, uh, you understand that I was very satisfied with Miss Jenks' work. She's been with us almost five years now. 
She's a very pleasant person. Answer my question! Well, Mr. Evans called. He suggested that the bank cut down a bit and... And uh, suggested that they start with Miss Jenks. Well, yes. And she's a perfect secretary in every way. She works hard and minds her own business. But just because her name happens to be Jenks, because she's the daughter of a man whom you blindly choose to hold responsible for this accident to my eye, you fire her too. Now go ahead. I dare you to justify that kind of action. I don't have to justify anything to anybody. If I may say something, that... I should never give it into the idea of your going into the machine shop. You're too emotional, you can't be trusted. Trusted? For what? To be among people that are beneath you. You've got some sort of a crazy complex. You take all their troubles on your own shoulders. And you're above everybody else. You're the supreme law, the infallible lord of the land, I suppose. Look, son, you just got a slight cut over your eye. You might have been killed. I can replace Jenks with a hundred, no, a hundred thousand times over and over. But I can never replace you. Ed Jenks is about the most decent human being I've ever known. His daughter's a nice girl. I can't allow you to persecute those two people for something that was my fault to begin with. You can't allow me? No. If you don't give them back their jobs, I'm clearing out. Clearing out where? Well, it doesn't matter. Just, just so long as I'm not a partner in this kind of inhumanity. Is it inhuman for a father to be interested and concerned in his son's safety? Well, I can see there isn't any sense in trying to talk to you about this thing. You, you seem to think you're doing something commendable. I think it's unspeakable. But your father said you ought to stay in. If he phones again, just tell him I haven't been home. Where are you going, sir? I don't know. Out. I may be home tonight, and I may not. Get in and drive me somewhere. Were you still mad at me about last night? You're the one who got sore. Well, have it your way. Let's kiss and make up. Ooh, you really put your heart behind that one, didn't you? Why didn't you come to the house for dinner with your father? We saw enough of each other today. So I gathered from the way he talked to Daddy. What's happened to you, Ray? Nothing. Oh, yes, something's changed you a lot. I noticed it last night. Now, with all the wild stories I'm hearing, why are you deserting your class? My class, as you call it, is mankind. So's yours, but you just haven't had a chance to find it out yet. So I found it out, that's all. And that's a change for the better, as far as I'm concerned. Well, fully for you. What's the next step? Swap this mansion on the hill for a shack across the tracks? No. Maybe get rid of the shacks across the tracks, that's all. Oh, let's stop all this arguing, Ray. Come on, honey. Get in. Let's go someplace and dance and have fun. Let's forget this nonsense. After all, we haven't been together... really been together for... For almost a year. Not tonight, Betty. I'm in no mood for it. Where are you going? I don't know.
Yeti. You crazy? What's the Get matter? Out of there. You Ray Compton? Yeah, what about it? That's for being a Compton. And that's for Ed Jenkins. saw the men before? No, I didn't know who they were. Well, didn't they say anything to you? Well, not much. They... Are you quite sure that Ed Jenks had nothing to do with this? No, of course not. How did I get in here? Well, highway patrol found you. Now, you rest. I'm going to find out who did this if I've got to tear that plant apart man by man. That won't change the way the men feel about you and me. It's of no importance of how the men feel about anything. I'll see you again tonight. My father wanted to come and see you, too. But I told him not to. There's a lot of talk going around that, that he was the reason you were beaten up last night. Ray, I, I want you to know he had nothing to do with it. Oh, I never thought he did. Not even for a moment. He really feels terrible about it, though. Who did beat up my son? I don't know. And neither does my father know. Well, you can tell your father I'm going to find out. What's he going to do? I don't know. But don't you worry. And tell Ed. Tell your father not to worry either. I can understand why, why you and he might think Daddy had something to do with it. I mean, well, Dad being fired on account of you. I never thought that. Are you awfully hurt? Well, I, I have a few caved-in ribs, and, and the doctor says I, I have a slight concussion, but I'll be all right. Daddy has the men working on it, trying to find out who did it. What men? Oh, some of his friends, just friends. Jania, I'd like to help your father. He's as anxious as you are to find out who did it. I mean, because... Of... I really would like to help him. Just tell him that. And thanks for coming over to see me. Take care of yourself. There is no question but what some of you know who committed this assault on my son. Until you come forward and name the criminals, ten of you will be discharged daily. So think it over. Be loyal to a few hoodlums and lose your job. Be loyal to J.R. Compton and get a reward. Think it over. Does he mean that ten guys are going to be fired every day, whether they know who done it or not? That's what he means. That will get some action, J.R. Well, it's the only thing they can understand. There might possibly be some demonstrations, Mr. Compton. You're employed to protect the company's property. How you do it is up to you. Yes, sir. Have you given any thought as to when you want to go back to work? What kind of work? Well, I think it's a waste of time uh, for you to go back to the machine shop. You've been there a year now. That's enough, isn't it? Look, son. I want you to learn management. You can't find out anything about my problems working over a lady. I think I've learned quite a bit about your problems working over a lady. What have you done about Ed Jenks and his daughter? 
Uh, it's something I'll probably regret for a long time. I told Evans to put him back to work. I only did this to teach you a lesson. You'll not get another honest hour's work out of Jenks, you'll see. You, uh, you coddle a worker and you create a loafer. What are you creating by these wholesale firings? Well, I stopped that today, too. Not because I wanted to. Not because I was giving in. But I'm going to find out who beat you up if it takes me the rest of my life. I'll start work first of the week. Well, see you in the morning. I, I've got a date. Yeah. Betty Coughlin. Jane Jenks. Thank you for both Daddy and myself. For getting our jobs back. Oh, it's only as it should be. I know, but... Well, it was a nice surprise just the same. The bank seemed kind of glad to have me back. Why not? I hear you're real efficient. Pretty, too. I'm glad you think so. I think a lot of nice things about you. I hope you do about me, too. I do, Ray, but... I can't be casual about you. I have to be or I'll get hurt. doesn't make sense. Yes, it does. You're the town rich boy. I'm just one of the girls that, that works in one of the places your father owns. I'm not any different than most other girls. Oh, yes, you are. Naturally, I'm... I'm flattered that you want to take me out. I guess it's natural to dream a little and think I'm the only girl for you. You are, Jane. That's Cinderella stuff. And I stopped believing in Cinderella about the time I learned there was no Santa Claus. You through? What's that for? I guess I'm through. I mean, Ray, I never felt about anybody before way I feel about you. It's, it's not a pleasant feeling. It, it scares me. I don't get it. First you say you like me. I do. Then, then you say you don't like the way you feel about me. I don't. How Cinderella and Santa Claus got into this, I, I don't know. All I do know is that I, I think about you all day and all night. I love you, Jane. Please. Don't punish me just because my father's rich. Want a kiss? Please take me home now. No. Don't try to kiss me again. Just let me go home and think about you for a while.
Before we take up anything else, I'd like to, very unofficially, introduce to you the man who will one day officially represent the Compton Company, Mr. Ray Compton. I... I don't blame you for not quite trusting me. But I, I would like to make plain why I'm supporting your organization. It's really very simple. I believe that the company will operate more efficiently and show more profit if the workers are happily secure in their jobs and treated with respect and dignity. And he stood up there big as life Telling everybody how he was going to support the organization. Try to get you to give in to him. This is incredible. My son working against me. I asked you a question. I remember. Well? Have you told your father about us? Have you told yours? Don't joke with me, Ray. I'm serious. Well, he... He knows I've been seeing a lot of you. Does he approve? Frankly, no. He has his heart set on my marrying Betty Coughlin. Fine old family, loaded with dough. Big deal. Amalgamation of combined fortune. That sort of stuff. The only problem is that I'm in love with you. Clear up to here. And then some. Look, I'm the one that has to approve, not my father. I'm asking you to marry me. I don't know whether I could take it or not, Ray. Being my wife? Being your father's daughter-in-law. The girl from across the tracks who married into the family to get into the Compton fortune. Treated with suspicion all the time as if I wasn't even housebroken. Hey, I ought to take you down to the lake and wash your mouth out with soap. Such awful talk from such a pretty mouth. I'm only trying to be practical, Ray. Realistic. I love you, Jane. How much more realistic does it have to be? I love you too, Ray. But we're both grown up enough to know that, well, that isn't all it takes. The really important part of a marriage is mutual respect and admiration and friendship. I don't... Well, I mean real friendship. The kind that goes beyond what generally passes for the word. And I don't know whether we'd ever get a chance to prove how good we were at the important part of a marriage. Why not? Why? Look, you're going to own the factory someday. Most of this town. You'll want to keep them, as you should. You'll have to spend most of your life with people that are, well, on the same level as you are. Even if you don't like it, ever, well, you'll I, still have to do it. I don't see what, what that has to do with it. I... Ray, I, I don't want to cost you anything. I never want to have to face the day when I see you looking at me, thinking that you should have married a girl like, well, like Betty Coughlin. No, wait, don't interrupt me. A girl who was raised with wealth and, and able to be at ease with millionaires. Able to be a perfect hostess to, even to a president of the United States or, or the Queen of England. I could just see myself in that spot. Any one of my 30 maids could do better. I do love you with all my heart, Ray. I could never stand letting you down. I thank you for your proposal. But you'd better think about it for quite a long time. You're not just an ordinary guy with a head full of dreams and ambitions starting at the bottom of something. You're starting right at the top. You need someone who can keep you there, not pull you down rung by rung. You know what I'm going to do? First, I'm 
gonna kiss you again. Second, tomorrow I'm, I'm gonna take you down to see a head doctor and get some of that crazy thinking out of you. And third, when I get home tonight, break the news to my father. And after he congratulates me on my splendid choice, I'll be married. And that'll be that. Now, I don't want to hear anything more out of you except yes. I say. Okay. I mean, yes. something about you tonight that I don't consider so wonderful. You're at the bottom of all the trouble that's going on at the factory. Can you deny it? What am I being asked to deny? Don't play cagey with me. You know what I'm talking about. Yes, I do. Oh, you lost your senses. What could you be thinking of? Here I am grooming you to take over the factory, to take over everything. And the moment that's going on, you're busy selling out to the enemy. Actually lending the name of Compton. Why? Why? Because I want to take over a healthy business, not a sick one. Sick? Yes, yeah, sick. You have no efficiency in your factories because you've destroyed the initiative of your men. Not one of them work with you. Or even for you, they just work for a check. And what are you going to give them when they're working for you? Security. A chance to advance for those that want. Treatment as human beings. Dignity. Fine, fine. We'll trade them that for what we're paying them now. Then see how much work you're going to get out of them on that kind of a basis. There's one very simple principle you can't seem to understand. You can buy a man's time and his physical presence at a certain place. But you can't buy enthusiasm, loyalty, initiative, a man's joy in his work. Joy in working? Yes. Something you must have known once. But you've forgotten it, and that's where the trouble is. I only learned it a little while ago. The joy, the, the great sense of accomplishment. I felt the first time I turned out a perfect piece of work on a lathe. Look at those hands. They were dirty, but they had a dignity a man feels when he knows he's done a worthwhile job. You, you can't treat your machinists like some low species of animal. They're human beings and worthy of of respect. Ah, you're soft. Underneath you're just as soft as she was. He coddled you. She built your head up with a lot of pap about, about love thy neighbor. If I listened to her, why I'd still be pushing a broom around somebody else's basement. Shut up. Now go back to your precious workers. And tell them from me that Compton will not give in. I'll close up the factory if necessary. And I'll starve them out of town. And you too. Why, you don't deserve to... Bear my name. Only hers. I told you to shut up! Why, you ungrateful papa! Ray, I didn't mean it. Ray. Come back, Ray. I didn't mean it. Ray, I loved you, Mother. Oh, I loved you so much.
Mr. Compton. I want to go in the machine shop for a while. Yes, Mr. Compton. <clears throat> Anything I can do, Mr. Compton? No. Just leave me alone. You go on about your business. Yes, Mr. Compton. up soon, Mr. Compton. Yeah. <laughs> look at that. <laughs> Take a look. I feel how smooth it is. Isn't <laughs> that And it's... It's absolutely perfect. <laughs> Isn't that... <laughs> I made it. I made it from this blueprint. What is it? Factory, go out of business. Look, boy, come over here. Sit down. Look, you're you're just all wrought up about what happened in between him and you tonight. Oh, not anymore, Ed. I was. I'd have to be to get you out of bed at three o'clock in the morning. I don't want his factory. I I don't want anything from him. All I want is. I want Jane to be my wife. We'll, we'll move out of away from here and 
I can make my own living. I, I don't need my father's money. Neither does your daughter. Hello? Yes? Yeah. No. No, you didn't wake me, Mr. Compton. Yeah. It, I think so. I... I don't see any reason why not. No. No, one o'clock will be fine. What? Yes. Yes, he's here. Just a moment. He wants to talk to you. What's he want? I don't know what he wants to say to you, but he, he told me that he'd like to get together with us at one o'clock this afternoon. He wants to talk to me? That's what he said. She didn't mean that. Otherwise, I, I, I could never see you again, Dad. Get it down to 875,000. Then you can stand at the same machine with me. Yeah, I'll, I'll be there. Now, you better get some rest. I may have a pretty rough time of it this afternoon. So long. Let's continue, please, gentlemen. This, uh, this next item is a rather odd one. I think you wanted to speak to Mr. Compton about this. Oh, yes. Uh, it's, uh, about everyone having to grow petunias. What do you got against petunias? Well, nothing, but some of the people living in your houses, uh, are marigold and aster fans. Some like snapdragons, and there's Quite a group that would like to plant stock. Oh, yes? Well, that's fine. That'll save us some money. Fire all the guns! <laughs> From now on, all our renters will, will maintain their own garden. However, those who stick to petunias, well, they can have the free gardening service. <laughs> As a sort of a special inducement. <laughs> My factory police just picked up two of your soapbox orders. What were they doing? They were telling a large group of the men that it was us 
The factory police have beat up your son. That we made a mistake. Where did you pick him up? Half an hour ago. Let's have a look at him. Bring him in, Paul. You have no authority to hold us. We'll sue you for a million dollars. Yeah, maybe two million. We grabbed them outside the gate of the foundry. Yes, so I heard. You're going to be sued for false arrest, Mr. Big Shot. I'll put you out of business. Your private army finally caught up with you, Compton. We weren't even on factory property when they pulled us in. Just a minute. You're one of the dirty muscle boys who ran my car off the road and beat me up. Too bad I didn't do a better job. Are these the men that did it? Hold it, J.R. And you too, son. We've got laws to take care of assault and battery cases. Just because they broke the law, don't you do it. Let the court decide the punishment for these two. Are these your men? No, they're not. They're as red as they come. They work in a pair. Take them down to jail and book them. Call up the FBI. Rail prefer charges the first thing in the morning. It'll be a pleasure. <laughs> you know, I think it's about time we handed out some presents to, to help celebrate this wedding anniversary. Hmm? I've got something here for Jane. Oh, it's heavenly. You like it? Do you mind if I put it on? There, good. Yeah. You. Thank you. It belonged to my wife, Ray's mother. I'm quite sure that she would want you to have it. Thank you so much. That goes for me too, Dad. And now something for you, son. This is the most valuable gift of all. Uh, I thought that uh, you ought to have it, inasmuch as you're going to sit in the driver's seat from now on. It'll keep you from forgetting what I forgot. The joy a man feels when he knows that his work is worth doing. 